Right, good afternoon folks, I'm joined by BDO World number one, Glenn, how's it going? Yeah, really good, uh, just nice and settled in, now happy to get over the first match, so it's three or four days now of just making sure I'm prepared for the last 16 game. I was going to say, the last time we sat down was probably in June at Selsey, so there's, there's plenty of gone on since then. I remember it being a lot warmer in that interview, I was, uh, I was yeah. sweating away on that one last Correct. time. It was it's, a warm, uh, it's warm yeah. down there. It's nice and cool here today, so, but um, yeah, no, I'm feeling really good. No, I say, we'll, we'll start at the top, must be pleased to have got through your first round game, tough game against Nick Kenny. It was no surprise to me that it was a tough game, uh, a lot of the interviews I did before did say he was the guy that most players didn't want to play first round. He did come out the blocks really quickly. Um, so it was a real test of my character. Uh, and what I would say is I think I might have lost that game two years ago, uh, but I didn't panic uh, and I stayed nice and focused. And when my time came, I, you know, I executed the doubles, which was uh, probably the, the vital difference between the two of us. I was going to say, the one six seven, the first check out at this yeah. year's Lakeside has set a pretty high standard. It was good, uh, that, that was certainly irrelevant in the match in the end. Um, th there was a finish, an 82 and an 84 I remember, which was much more important. But the only problem with that one six seven now, every time someone leaves a 170, I'm on edge because it's worth five grand, uh, the highest finish. So. Uh, you know, I've got to try and stop watching the games and uh, panicking a little bit. But Jim Hughes left it a couple of times last night, so yeah, hopefully no. someone doesn't get that. Definitely. Would you prefer to be pushed the way you were in your first round match to set you up for the rest of the tournament instead of having like an easy passage for a couple of games? Yeah, that's a really good question there actually, and um, I, I just think it answered a couple of questions for me. And I'm not panicking when the odds are against me. It's 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 not easy being the number one seed. And, People have given me the trophy uh, in Middlesbrough because they just think it's going to be a walk in the park and it's far from that. So to be pushed and win the game I think is more pleasing than just winning quite comfortably 3 nil. So I think it had, it had its real positives of being a tough game. Definitely. You successfully defended your Masters title here at Lakeside. Are you superstitious? Have you sort of like done the same routines that you did for the Masters running into the world, being I, at the same venue? I was a very superstitious person I try to do the opposite now if I'm nervous about something I'll you know whether it's the same pair of socks whether it's walking down the stairs whether it's been in the same room I try to do the opposite now because once superstition gets into it becomes difficult because darts is a mind game so yeah. in answer to that I try to do the opposite of what the superstition is cool. um, as, as you said most people have, have almost given you the title who do you think are your biggest dangers at this year's tournament I've, um, yeah, it, it's difficult and certainly in, in, in Middlesbrough people give me the trophy already and uh, it, it's far from that. I know I'm a favourite, I know I'm number one seed but it is a real level playing field and even players who are out of form can come to Lakeside and do really, really well and the example I'd give there was Scott Waits. Uh, you know, there's three people who immediately come to mind and all three in the bottom half of the draw. Uh, Scott Mitchell uh, is always tough at Lakeside, I find him a really tough uh, competitor and very respect, you know, I, I respect what he does and what he's about. Scott Waits is, you know, someone who always comes here uh, uh, and does really well. Uh, and and Daryl Fitton, you know, that might surprise some people, but I just think he, Ted Anke said to me in exhibition this year that he thinks Daryl will win this competition. Big score, a big crowd on his side, and uh, I've played him on that stage before, and I've, it's really really difficult. So, you know, then I've got people like Jamie Hughes, you know, Darius Wesley. And Paul Hogan, who could be my next opponent, you know, people are, are talking about him being a good outsider, so I'm just trying to focus on myself, really. You touched on there about your next opponent. Do you look at draws and do you study who you could have and your potential route to the latter stages, or do you just, whoever it is, it is? Yeah, I'm terrible for looking at draws, um, but the biggest um, compliment I can give Nick Kenny is I never looked at the draw once I realised I was playing Nick. I never looked past him because that's how good of a player Nick Kenny is and he'll be a top five seed next year and that, you know, that's a statement I'll make he's already won the jersey open this year so he's got off to a flyer already so to be honest with you I haven't really looked at the draws much though I do know I play either Martin Phillips or Paul Hogan uh, in my next match Cool. 2016 has arguably been your best ever year in, in darts what's been the standout moment of 2016 for you? I mean it started off terribly obviously with the Scott Waits loss uh, so I thought the question was going to be there is I, I think that the biggest thing I'm happy with is how I've bounced back from that because when I left Lakeside last year I did not want to look at a dartboard for a long time I got my darts back out just shy of the Scottish Open where I played excellent 
but Madaj Razma was absolutely on inspired that day. Uh, but take away the Scottish Open, every competition I've entered now, I've I've got to the latter stages, and um, my consistency is really really good. You know, I think the World Masters is the obvious answer. The Finders Masters, you know, to win that two two times in a row. English Open at uh, Celsius was great, but I think the standout moment is um, we've been going to Bridlington for 10, 12 years now. I take over 100 people with me. So to win on that Bridlington stage in front of them where the crowd was absolutely amazing. So I think the standout moment of 2016 was winning in Bridlington. Brilliant. And also in 2016, you played your first PDC tournament at the Grand Prix, I'm sorry, the Grand Slam. And you, um, it's fair to say that you caught the eye of a lot of darts fans that didn't really know who you were. For me, the standout moments, obviously, the game against Gary, even though you lost, it was arguably one of the games of the tournament. And eventually when Barney beat you, I've never seen a five times world champion look relieved to get off the stage as if he did. Did you enjoy the whole PDC experience? I mean, enjoyed even doesn't begin to, to let you know how, what my memories of that competition are. I just, it was the first competition in a long time where I haven't been the favourite. The first leg against Gary Anderson was a bit of a whirlwind. I didn't know where I was. And there was 180 I hit in the first three darts of the second leg. And when I pegged that double to go one each, the rest of the competition, I felt really, really comfortable on that stage. Uh, the PDC were fantastic. Uh, the professionalism was amazing. The crowd was was sensational. I had Mac Elkin by my side all the way there, which you know made me get used to being with a team. And uh, you know he made me. You know I was Mensa was there and Dimmy was there, so. It was a really, really special week, and uh, you know the public of Wolverhampton were were, were fantastic, also. So, something um, that I'll look back on with definite fond memories of 2016. At the end of the Barney game, you two had quite an embrace. What did he say to you? Because a lot of people, because it was quite a long conversation, a lot of people asked, what, "What did he say to you?" Oh, I'm not sure what he said to me, but I've stayed in contact with Barney, and the first, I think, I got something like 200, 300 social media, Twitter. Uh, text message was within five minutes of my game against Nick Kenny but the one that stood out was three words from um, fr from Barney and it was just you know something like congratulations and a couple of other words from there but you know Barney stays in touch with me and I find it very inspirational I like I, I'm a big fan of his um, I'm not sure what he said I remember his I remember his statement afterwards that I was quite a methodical slow player and that's sort of like I didn't like that because I didn't realise I was that slow and it's made me think that but he's been absolutely fantastic and uh, you know, yeah, if Barney is, uh, he'll send me a, good, a message before I play again now so it was very good. Peter Rice, Gary Anderson, these people made me feel very, very welcome and I was very grateful for that. I was going to say, you, didn't, you weren't out of place there at all from me looking in, um, so did that give you the taste of maybe playing PDC darts? I'm closer to 50 now. Um, you know, there's, I'm running out of challenges now. Um, you know, the, the only focus I can tell you honestly, the only focus I've got at this precise moment is Lakeside. I've got a big decision to make uh, in, in a couple of days' time, and it could depend on how well I do this week. What people don't realise is that when you come to Lakeside, you have to sign a contract. That contract stipulates that you're not, you're not available to play in the PDC next year. I don't want to get involved in a legal battle if I'm you know, winning £100,000. It could be a little bit different if I'd lost first round, I'd be on my way home now. I would be contemplating Q-School. So you know, the, the honest answer is just let me focus on this week. Uh, I know people are interested and I find that quite flattering and whatever, but I'm still a working man. I've got to take that into consideration. Uh, this, the game of darts has gone really, really well for me the past couple of years. You know, but for 10, 15 years, it was just purely a hobby. Uh, I, you know, like many people, I've got, I've got a mortgage. Uh, not a very big one now, thanks to Dad. So I've just got a couple of decisions to make. I was going to say, obviously, if you were to go, I'm not putting words, but yeah. if you were to go, would that then be another question to ask? Do you then become a full-time professional? Yeah. Well, first of all, people are saying, are you going to the PDC? And the question I've got to say to people is, I've got to get through Q school first. And what, you know, I'm here for hopefully a week at Lakeside. It's mentally difficult. It's mentally tough. Uh, and then three or four days later, you're playing these hungry young people who want to get through to get a PDC tour card. 
I've got to take all that into consideration. It, you know, it is a big gamble what I'd be doing. I'd, I could be live happily ever after in the BDO. So there's many, many considerations for that. Would I leave work? There's no plans to. I've got a very good job. I've been there just shy of 30 years now. Um, it would be very, very difficult to start throwing a dart for a living. I quite like the balance in my life what it is now. No, that's great. I say, as you say, you've been at your work a long time. Would they help you find a balance, or do, do they help you find a balance between darts and work? They're very supportive, but I don't get no extra holidays, and I've got to use the same amount of holidays as other people. But my terms and conditions are very good. You know, we have flexi time and things like that, so I can maximise the amount of holidays and flexi that I do have. But they're very supportive. But dart, but work comes first. You know, they're yeah. a, they're a business, uh, and I manage uh, as many as five thousand properties. I've got a team underneath me as well, which, you know, so I've got to, it's not something where I'm just like in the middle of things. I've got a very challenging job. Cool. Also, obviously we're friends on social media as well. And I, I saw you enjoying the PDC World Championships. What was your thoughts on this year's um, spectacular at Ali Pali this year? Yeah, the product is amazing, isn't it? I mean, I'm quite a traditionalist, you know, I, I, I'll find it hard to beat the atmosphere that was at Lakeside on Saturday afternoon. It was special, you know. Every single person there was, a, you know, people who enjoyed the darts. There was a great uh, buzz in there. Real low ceilings, very unique place, the lakeside. You, you're so close to the public. Whereas the PDC, the, you know, the crowds are absolutely mental. But you know, I get a little bit frustrated when half of them are not watching the matches there. But you know, it was pretty special at Wolverhampton. So I can only think that Ali Pali is only double that. But what a sensational tournament and when you're watching Van Gerwen and Gary Anderson's in full flow it's spectacular to watch. I was going to say that I, I felt for the people playing Michael this year you had the record, the unwanted record of the losing average going mm. Christo Reyes 106 yeah, I think incredible. it was Barney losing with nearly 110 average was just yeah. ridiculous yeah. Um, do you think he'll do it, can he do it again the clean sweep Van Gerwen in your opinion? Yeah he's, he's special, I mean I, I was um, when I went to Wolverhampton I was watching what he drank, how he practised I mean there was a real funny story where we, I'd literally had three darts at the board and he said we have a practice you know, in his Dutch, real Dutch deep voice and I was like I didn't want to say no but I'd literally had three darts at the board I'd had no drink and you score three points for a 180 two for a 140 and one for a 100 and the first dart I went up with, I hit a slice to big five, and I thought, oh my God, this is just going to be a disaster, this. And I scored 45, but he only scored 60. So it was still nil-nil, then I went 180, 180, and then missed the nine darter. Then he did something, then I went back in at 180, 180. And there was a couple of lads stood next to me, Chris Dolby and Nathan Derry, and they were shaking their head at me. And they said, you should not have just beat him there again in that game because he'll be hunting for you for a long time. And then he, he went to do a TV interview and then he came back and he wanted me. So I started practicing with other people. I was getting a little bit frightened, to be honest with you. The guy is a winner. The guy, he just, he carried about this, all this aura with him when he was in that uh, back room. And, and uh, he's an amazing talent, And uh, but what a year he's had. No, definitely. And again, last time we spoke, obviously you said your admiration for Phil Taylor. Do you think this is the last year possibly we'll see Phil Taylor actively? Let him enjoy his retirement. I wish he would play darts with a smile now because I don't like to see him sort of grumpy or not happy with where his darts are at. He deserves a swan song. His best darts are probably behind him now, but what you know, what a player. What no one's ever gonna match the records he he did. And I just you know, part of me hopes there's a real something special there, maybe a World Series win. He, He's always tough to beat at Blackpool, and you know I hope there's one last hurrah for him. But I would, you know, he's not going to be someone who's just going to go and get beat first rounds, and you know he goes into the abyss. You know he's going to go in star, but it's more his demeanour now. I'd just like to see a little bit of a smile on his face rather than. No, agreed. You know, rather than what I've seen this year, but a, a legend. Agreed. Obviously, with the year you've had in 2016, have you noticed the exhibitions circuit pick, picked up for yourself now? Again, it goes back to work. I, I turn more exhibitions down than I accept because I've only got so many holidays. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, 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 I had a message yesterday to go and do a, a youth presentation uh, in June. So I don't look at the diary just yet because I don't know what 2017 is all about. There's a few scenarios that might even surprise people, uh, which, are, which are options as well. So. 
let's just see what happens this week and then you know that by this time next week I'll know exactly what I'm doing in 2017 and you know we'll, we'll go from there great I could say just touching back I'm going back into Lakeside obviously What's your preparation been like? Has it changed at all from normal? Have you upped the hours that you've put in on the board? Yeah, I'm down with Dennis Coleman again. Um, you know, so he's yeah, he's just marvellous at what he does. He looked after all my family who turned up, tickets, hotels. You know, he met them all, and I just have to focus on the darts. I'm, you know, you're interviewing me now in the um, Frimley Green Workingmen's Club, which I spend a lot of time. A lot of the players. I mean, Anka Zilch was in here. Now Scott Waite spends an awful lot of time down here. I don't like necessarily to be in the venue. I, you know, I went in there last night to watch Jamie Hughes, um, but I, I'm not keen on on the environment around there. I just like to get myself away, uh, and it works for me. So I'm itching to get playing again now. I've um, got another day to kill today and tomorrow, and I still don't know when I'm playing on Wednesday. And that's a little bit frustrating because people are travelling five hours, uh, and they need to know the details so I'm just sat waiting when I play uh, next as I say yeah, there's a big difference between going on first or, yeah. or last but as you say yeah, we're here in the Frimley Green Working Men's Club can yeah. only thank them for putting us up for the for the afternoon but it's a lovely facility to practice in for, for you guys yeah, it's got better every year we're just sat in a room now which was only getting built last year and uh, we had a fantastic night on Sunday night in here you know they treat me really really well and you know that's why Scott spends the hours in here and I think he dedicated his title last year to to say that the time he spent in his club, nice throw, good good boards and well looked after. So it's just horses for courses. You know, someone like Brian Dawson, he sits and watches every single match because he wants to soak up that atmosphere. So it, it's different for everybody. Uh, but I just find myself getting away off site. It works for me. Obviously, miles from home, but did you see the Boroughs win at the weekend still? We, I didn't see the win. In fact, I haven't even seen the goals yet, but we were kept very much updated. I was practising in... Um, Potter's stake, I was just down the road, uh, but it, it wasn't as good as in here. So we were getting messages. We were watching the Tottenham Aston Villa game, and I was getting messages to say that they'd got a great 3 0 win. So it's, uh, that was really important. I say, have you enjoyed Middlesbrough's first half of the Premier League season? Typical European manager, he plays for a 0 0. Um, it's not the exciting football we had when we had Ravinelli and Janino, but the year we went down. But we would gung ho, we would lose 4 3, 5 4. You know, this guy's nil nil one nil, so it's difficult to watch. Um, but he's building a, you know, he's building his type of team. Um, I've been, I'm the guest uh, on the 31st of January when they are home to West Brom. So it'd be fantastic to take the Lakeside title and take that on the pitch at half time. So that's a, that would be a real dream for me. Brent, obviously, um, you being Middlesbrough, Mac being Villa, yeah. are you going to take him one of the the games with him? Do you know, I think we're bagging all his reserves. We bought Brad Guzman, the, the keeper. We've bought Rudy Gestead, and uh, we bought that exciting young winger as well. Uh, who's, Troy Roy. Yeah, but it, I don't even think he... I don't even, he's just got so much pace, it's just he doesn't know what to do with that. And uh, But he's 20-year-old, and that's, I guess that's what Karank is there for. He's, he's going to have to turn him in, but he's got some pace. I don't think I've ever seen anyone so quick. and just gives us a different option, especially when we're away from home trying to break teams down. I think he'll buy in January. There's talk of Delafield from Everton uh, and uh, a couple of other players. I think what we need now is a creative midfielder. We play with sort of three defensive midfielders uh, and we're not really breaking teams down. Why is he bought instead? Is he thinking of going more direct? So, yeah, you know, look, it's, we're in the Premiership. We've got to enjoy, enjoy it while we can, while we're there. That's great. Well, thanks very much, Glenn, for, for joining us. Um, good luck for the rest of the tournament, and we, hopefully we shall speak in about a week with a nice silver trophy beside you and uh, some exciting news from yourself. Thank you very much. Thanks for all the work you're doing for me, Phil. It's really, really appreciated. No worries, guys. And remember, you can follow Glenn on Facebook, this Facebook page. We'll leave a link in the bio. Also, we'll give you a link to his Twitter. Always active on there. Any questions, please give him a shout, and we'll see what we can do. Cheers, guys.